Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 8, Demystifying the Internet, Part 3 of 3. In this lecture, we will examine a few illustrations that help us to see how information travels through the many twists and turns of the internet. When you use the internet, what you're doing is using your computer to send information or requests for information to other computers. These computers that store and deliver information are examples of networking computers called servers. Here's an image of a technician who's examining a large network server. When you send an email, you are telling your computer to send a message to be stored on a mail server. When you read your own email, you're asking your computer to access messages that have been stored for you on a server. When you view a web page, you're using your computer to display a web document that somebody else uploaded to a web server. When you download media files from internet stores like iTunes, Amazon, or Google Play, information is copied from a server to your computer. Not quite all internet content is on servers, though. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing software allows users to download files directly from each other's internet-connected personal computers rather than from a large central server. In either case, internet activity is the activity of machines sending information and information requests to each other. As we learned in previous lessons, every machine connected to the internet is affiliated with a unique IP address. When machines send information and information requests to each other, they send them to these IP addresses. And as we've seen in previous lessons, IP addresses are long strings of numbers. Computers have no trouble working with long, apparently random strings of numbers. But as you can imagine, we humans have trouble reading and remembering long strings of numbers like that. Think about it. How many IP addresses can you name from memory? I would guess that the answer is zero, and yet you probably request information from servers at various IP addresses every single day. So how do we use the internet without knowing the IP addresses of various servers? The answer is that we assign natural human language names to places on the internet. These natural names are called domain names. Both email addresses and web addresses are common examples of domain names. When you submit either an email address or a web address, your computer has to translate those domain names into numerical IP addresses. So when you punch in a web address, an email address, or any other domain name, how does your computer figure out what numerical IP address it should look for? The answer is that your computer must access a domain name service server, or DNS server for short. I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to use a couple illustrations from this textbook. Some of you may be taking a formal course that uses this textbook, but if you're not, that's okay. Just follow along with the video. This illustration helps us to see how domain name services work. In this illustration, Bob wants to visit www.dougj.net. When Bob submits the URL www.dougj.net into the address bar on his browser, his computer accesses a system called the Domain Name Service, or DNS. Internet-capable computers have an application on board that allows them to access this domain name service. Bob's computer will send a request to the DNS server at his local internet provider. This request asks the DNS server, hey, what's the IP address for DougJ.net? Sometimes the local server already knows the answer and so it can simply answer the question right away. However, the local DNS server may not know the answer, and in that case, the request gets sent further up the server tree to a higher level DNS server, and the question gets repeated. If the question isn't answered, it gets sent even further up the tree to a root server. A root server is responsible for a tremendous number of domain names. For example, a root server might be responsible for all domain names that end in .com, or all domain names that end in .net. The root server must either know the IP address for all of these domains, or at least it must know where to find these IP addresses. If the root server doesn't know the IP address for DougJ.net, it knows how to route the request so that it makes it to a server that does know. The root server might send the request back down the tree to a different lower level DNS server, which might eventually send the request to the local DNS server for DougJ.net. If this domain name exists, then the local DNS server will definitely know its IP address. In this case, the requested IP address is 129.186.105.24. The IP address gets sent back through the network of DNS servers. And eventually, it makes it back to Bob's computer. Once Bob's computer knows the proper numerical IP address, it can make an information request from the machine storing the web page data. 
Bob's computer might now store the IP address for later use. Although it takes a while to explain the process of accessing an IP address from a DNS server, the computers involved carry out this operation so rapidly that we normally don't even realize that anything has happened. Okay, that's how DNS servers help coordinate IP addresses. Now let's look at another common networking device, routers. Throughout this introduction to the internet, I have mentioned machines called routers, and I have referred to some information being routed across the web. But with all of the millions of devices connected to the internet, how exactly do routers direct traffic to the right IP addresses? Well, let me show you. This next illustration helps us to see how information is routed. In this illustration, we have two networks, network one and network two. You might notice that router one is connected to both networks, and so it has two different IP addresses. When you're looking at router one as a member of network one, then its IP address is 192.168.1.1. But when you're looking at router one as a member of network two, then its IP address is 207.20.15.1. So those two IP addresses don't refer to different devices, they just refer to the same device from different perspectives on different networks. Network one consists of three devices, Alice's computer, Bob's computer, and router one. Network two also consists of three devices, Carol's computer, router one, and router two. Notice that network one has no direct connection to the internet. Network one can only connect to the internet through network two. Every device on a computer network has something called a route table. A route table contains instructions for routing information to a given IP address. To keep the clutter down, we have only included three of these route tables in the picture. The one for Alice's computer, the one for router one, and the one for Carol's computer. But the other computers and routers would also have their own route tables too. Let's look at Alice's route table first. Alice's route table has two columns the destination column, and the next hop column. When Alice's computer wants to send information to an IP address in the destination column, it follows the directions in the next hop column. The first row on her route table tells us that information going to any IP address on network one will be sent directly to that IP address. For example, Alice's computer can send information directly to Bob's computer. These computers are networked together directly, so there's no need to relay the information through another network. But what happens if Alice's computer tries to send information to any other IP address, one that's not listed on the route table? For IP addresses not listed on the route table, Alice's computer will send information to the default next hop, which in this case turns out to be router1. Once router1 receives the information, it will run the destination IP address through its own route table. So let's take a look at the route table for router one. If information is destined for any IP address on network one or network two, then router one will send this information directly to that IP address. It can do that because it's connected directly to both of those networks. If the information is destined for any IP address outside of these two networks, then router one will default to sending the information to router two. From router two, this information would continue on through the internet, most likely to be directed by several more route tables before reaching its final destination. So if Alice wanted to send information to Bob's IP address, then Alice's route table would direct that information directly to Bob's computer. If Alice wanted to send information to Carol's computer, then the route table on her computer would direct that information to router one, and then the route table on router one would direct that information to Carol's computer. If Alice wanted to access a web page somewhere else on the internet, then the route table on her computer would direct that information to router one, the route table for router one would direct that information to router two, and then so on throughout the internet until Alice's web page request re reached the appropriate server somewhere on the internet. Now let's trace a couple of routes from Carol's computer. If Carol wanted to send information from her computer to Bob's computer, then her route table would direct that information to router one, and then the route table at router one would direct that information to Bob's computer. If Carol wanted to send information to an IP address that is on neither network one or network two, then her route table would default to sending that information to router two, which would then run through its route table to direct that information to the next address in line. In this illustration, we've simplified the route tables so that they're easier to understand. Real route tables have more lines of instructions than the route tables in this illustration, I hope that you can see how complex networks can run on relatively short route tables. 
Indeed, the route table on your computer is probably much less than a page long, and yet it allows you to connect to potentially billions of IP addresses. Now, so far, we've examined how computers use domain name service or DNS servers to translate domain names that are easy for people to read into IP addresses that are easy for computers to read. We've also examined how computers and routers use route tables to route information through networks. Now we're going to examine one last illustration that will help you to see how computers access web pages. Web pages are special documents that are stored on high capacity computers called web servers. When you access a web page on your computer, you send an information request to the IP address of a server, and the server sends that information back to the IP address of your computer. Your computer's web browser allows your computer to display the web page. Web pages are highly flexible documents. They can display text, images, audio, video, and interactive programs like games. But what makes web pages really special is their ability to link to other web pages. That's why we call them web pages. They're connected together like a web. As you can see in the illustration, when Bob accesses www.dougj.net, his computer accesses the web server that hosts that website. The website, dougj.net, consists of a cluster of files that are stored on that computer. Each file contains all or part of a web page, which Bob can view in his web browser. The first page that comes up when Bob navigates to dougj.net will be the home page. Because of the interconnected nature of the web, this home page can link to several other web pages. Furthermore, any of these web pages could link to any other page on the web. So a link at dougj.net could make Bob's computer request the homepage for www.anothersite.net. And then Bob might begin exploring the various web pages associated with anothersite.net. In all probability, the web document files for anothersite.net would be located on a completely different server than the files associated with dougj.net. Indeed, these servers could be on opposite sides of the globe. But if Bob has a good internet connection, he can browse through those web documents stored on servers thousands of miles apart more quickly than he could browse through a book on the other side of his office. This is all thanks to the lightning quickness of electric signals and the shrewd networking techniques that we've been describing in these lessons. Okay, that's all for now on the internet. I hope that it's a little less mysterious now than it was before. Now, this course isn't intended to make you a networking wizard, but we hope that if you have a clearer mental picture of what the internet is and how it works, then you'll be better prepared to understand how the internet plays into different security issues. In the next lesson, we're going to begin learning about passwords, which are very important for cybersecurity.